given an opportunity to speak to the women in the church via this Zoom process. And um, she said how strange it was. She was sitting at home doing this and, and there on the screen were all these, she said, all these, all these blank faces <laughs> of these people all sitting in their homes uh, listening to her. And uh, she felt it was a bit off-putting. Um, but there's so much about today and the way things are today f f for us in terms of uh, church and fellowship and ministry, uh, as Sheila was mentioning in her prayer, which is all so foreign to us and so contrary to what we would consider to be right and normal. But here we are. And having said all of that, I'm grateful that uh, I do have some people here, uh, real people to talk to and uh, to just do some of the recordings we've done with no one present, just my faithful friend at the back there who's recording. Um, it's definitely strange, but great to be together anyway, and uh, praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the title, I don't normally do this, but uh, I have chosen a title in advance for what I want to share with you this morning. And that title is Discovering the Holy Spirit. And um, I can almost hear voices out there objecting to that statement and saying, well, surely you've got that the wrong way around somewhere, have we not? Um, but uh, I don't think I have got it the wrong way around. Um, and I'm certainly clear about the way in which I'm thinking about that statement this morning. Um, I'm thinking from the human perspective. Um, I fully appreciate that God is, and how many times do I say this, he is the initiator of everything. Uh, it's not us trying to find God. He knows who we are, so he's not trying to find us either. Um, but he knows who we are and he knows what his plans are for each one of us. Um, well in advance, before time as a matter of fact. And... Uh, but in, in, the, in the process of uh, being human and uh, being alerted to the things of God, um, there is a sense in which um, our desire and our longing is to know more about him. We want to know more about the person of the Holy Spirit. We want to know more about his his purpose, his working, what he's doing, what he's attempting to achieve in our lives and so forth and so on. So there are very many ways in which we could pursue this, uh, it seems to me. Um, but what I want to do this morning is to think about discovering the Holy Spirit, but I want to do it through the eyes of those early disciples. That's the way I'm approaching it. And um, the, I, I, I want to do it, excuse me if this sounds strange for me speaking in this way, but I, I, it's as though I want to suggest three sort of video clips, as we say. We're not having videos or anything, but little cameo views of the early disciples in their process of getting to understand the things of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in, in doing that, I'm trusting that um, we'll be able to allow the Holy Spirit today, here, as he's dealing with us individually uh, right now, to have access to our hearts and to our minds and increase our understanding <clears throat> of what he's doing. Uh, before, before I go any further, I'm admitting to you that this subject that I'm sort of venturing on is so vast and so broad, and yet we have just a very limited time here. And so uh, at the end, this will be, there'll be brief cameos, and they won't all be of equal length, I promise you. Uh, and uh, th the way I'm thinking of this is I, I'm looking at the disciples and what they knew about the Holy Spirit after Jesus' resurrection first, that's the first video clip, and the second one will be after Jesus' ascension back to heaven. And then thirdly, after Pentecost. And may the Lord search all our hearts. Amen. 
in whatever way he chooses to do that as we pursue this. As I think about the early disciples, we could certainly broaden this and be thinking about during the period that they actually walked with Jesus and there's a lot to be found relevant in that period. Uh, but the way I've ch chosen to do this is um, after his resurrection, well, that includes everything that went before up until that point. And uh, the fact of the matter is that the days, particularly the most recent days prior to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, had been exceedingly dark days for the disciples. And uh, you all know exactly what I'm referring to. Um, but in particular, of course, highlighted when we find ourselves in Gethsemane and when we find ourselves at Calvary and we try to imagine uh, the, the impact these, these events were having on these precious men, the 11 now, uh, who were faithful to him. Uh, and so on. <clears throat> but even going back a little further, uh, on the other side of the cross and, and Gethsemane, to the hours immediately prior, uh, there had been so much that was confusing to them, in, indeed baffling uh, to them, and uh, strange for them to understand. I mean, Jesus was talking in terms of going away. I've got my Bible open here if you wish to open yours. I'm at chapter 16 of the Gospel of John right now. And in terms of them becoming confused and baffled by what Jesus was saying, let me just actually read a few verses here. Um, imagine this. <coughs> Excuse me. In verse 5, Jesus says, But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asks me, uh, whither goest thou? I'm reading from the old King James, as you can tell. Um, and uh, he says, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient or it's necessary, it's vital, it's critical uh, for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, he's referred to him in the chapter earlier already, but the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And then he says some other things, but I'm just leapfrogging, leapfrogging down to verse 13. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And he shall glorify me and receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore I said that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. A little while and you shall uh, not see me. And again, a little while and you shall see me because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples among, said among themselves, what is that he says unto us, a little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said therefore, what is this that he is saying? A little while, we cannot tell what he's saying. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves that I said a little while and you shall not see me and again a little while and you shall see me? And then it continues and you can read the rest at your leisure. But do you see what I'm trying to focus on here? Uh, that in these days now, immediately before the cross, and Jesus is talking about going away and yet coming back, and um, not only that, but it was vital that he went away so that this other person, who is referred to as the comforter, or again as the spirit of truth, uh, can come. And it's going to be to their great benefit that he comes. 
he's talking about another uh, who is who is really not another it was a strange confusing situation for them at that time we look back and we've got a much clearer view of things because we've got a broader view than they had with the rest of the scriptures here but that's what these men were facing and uh, uh, it was all strange then of course it moved on to the actual events of gethsemane and calvary and all of that the whole thing uh, was was baffling but now, um, after the uh, resurrection, uh, there was still mystery. I mean, the fact that Jesus had risen from the dead and they'd seen him, uh, which, I mean, of course, was just amazing in the extreme. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, it only raised more questions. Um, in so many ways um, but so they, they were they were baffled they were confused and yet post resurrection there was also this this supernatural if you like because it was outside of the normal realm of things this this supernatural confidence that whatever it was he was talking about will all come to pass somehow or other because look <laughs> this remarkable miracle has taken place now it wasn't just that they were being given all this baffling information but he'd actually been brutally brought to death on the cross and he's now alive again three days later uh, that had to bring incredible uh, confidence to them that uh, things that he'd intimated hinted at hinted at rather in his teaching and so on that he was in fact the incarnate son of god was was now completely credible uh, that would bring great confidence to him and and for these men at this stage after the resurrection as they they thought about these things and 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 considered them um, they would remember the the uh, the privilege of being called by him they were called by this one who who clearly is whom he claimed to be the incarnate son of god and that they had been chosen by him i mean talk about privilege uh, and that they had had the indescribable benefit of, of being with him and be, being with him as his friend for three and a half years uh, to fellowship with this incredible man they knew him to be that and they listened to his great statements but now look he's alive again from the dead and uh, they had seen his miracles uh, they had listened to his teaching they'd witnessed his death and they witnessed his resurrection that gave them great confidence in the future. Just pausing here, what, what an incredible story these men would have and had, clearly, at that particular time. Um, they, they had also, during that period, they, they had 40 days more after his resurrection to be with him. Talk about out of this world experiences, but they're with him. And we spent this some time a week or two ago thinking about the way that Jesus had passed the message along to them. Do you remember? And said, uh, tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. And I believe, I'm convinced that the bulk of those 40 days would have been sp spent in the familiar area of Galilee. Um, and we're told very plainly in scripture that during that period he, he taught them he continued to teach them and speak about the kingdom of God and so on this is adding to the story that, that I've already been trying to sort of paint or the picture I've been trying to paint uh, for you up until this point um, Please stay with me, but allow me just to use my imagination for a moment. 
and this is, a, this is a big stretch of your imagination to come with me, but imagine if today, at this point in time, this is so outrageous, I'm afraid to even say it, uh, but an announcement was somehow made um, that, that one or two of those very disciples were going to hold an event um, they would probably choose Liverpool because that's the capital of the universe. Uh, you, you'd probably say, well, shouldn't it be Jerusalem? But you, the, supposing it was announced that there was a venue, uh, I don't know what kind of venue it would be, but in a specific location where these two disciples who had experienced all of these great privileges that we've been talking about, the staggering experiences, uh, they'd known the incarnate Son of God, they'd walked with him, fellowshiped with him, they'd seen him put to death, they'd seen him after his resurrection, they'd fellowshiped with him for another 40 days, uh, and they're going to be in town on Tuesday, you know. Uh, and can you just imagine um, the kind of chaos that would bring? We think we've got chaos today, uh, but in terms of... Of, of, of people around the entire world, I mean, who had the means and ability, they would want to be there for that event. I'm talking of people primarily, there would be religious people, Christian people, uh, to have this opportunity to be with them. And, uh, 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 you know, they would be able to talk about all these, these remarkable things. Um, it would, the, the only reason I'm even mentioning this is to try to highlight to our attention the incredible privilege of these disciples who with all of the confusion and all of the uncertainty about so much that Jesus was and the things that he was saying, this was an incredible privilege that these men had experienced. And at the end of those 40 days, you remember, Jesus led them to Bethany. Bethany seemed to be a, a place he liked to be. He knew he was loved in Bethany. Uh, but on, on the slopes of Mount Olivet. And uh, he talked to them once again. And uh, let's just read what he said to them, shall we? Just come to the end of Luke's Gospel with me. Chapter 24. We we'll see this. <clears throat> Just reading toward the end of the chapter. And verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Go back to Jerusalem, in other words. Uh, until you be endued from power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. But the story continues. And I'm looking at my second video clip <clears throat> at this point. And this is what they knew after Jesus' ascension. So it's moving on in time. Uh, there would be ten more days before the great feast of Pentecost. Now Jesus has left them physically. He's gone from them. They've got this promise that, of, of the Father, according to Jesus. And, and I'm confident, as I try to think of these men, although they were um, greatly privileged, they were just human beings, and I'm a human being, and so I try, I'm not in their situation and never shall be in their situation, but as I try to imagine myself there, in that little group, through those 10 days, with this promise and this commission, this command of Jesus, don't leave Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. 
I'm sure that there was certainly questions in their own minds, but I think in the context of their conversation, they would be asking one another questions. Like, what are you, what, what are you thinking about this? I mean, um, what exactly are we waiting for? That would be a reasonable question. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if someone said, well, well, let's just recap for a minute. Let's just think over the earlier events and try to get some clearer sense of what, what's going on. Um, someone would say, well, one thing's for sure, whatever it is that's going to happen, is going to happen soon. Because uh, in Acts chapter 1, and I'm turning there now, excuse me, moving around quite a bit here, uh, they would remember how uh, the scripture reads in Acts 1 and verse 5, for John truly baptized, uh, no, I'll go back to verse 4. You know what, I'm going to go back even further, just covering what I've already talked about. Um, the, the chapter starts out. Uh, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that through the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, uh, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, all right, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For truly, John uh, baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he says to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. You can see clearly that there's a complete overlap of what I've just read to you from uh, Luke 24 and now in Acts chapter 1. And of course, Luke is the author of this document and there's a clear overlapping here uh, that we're finding. But there's a bit of extra information that we find uh, here. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I, I, I frankly th believe that the word ghost, and I'm a King James person at my root, is really not the best translation for us because it, I, I think it, if we were talking about the person of the Holy Spirit, and I'd like to do that sometime soon, uh, then I, I think the word ghost is a bit misleading really to us it, in the minds. It puts... Uh, a, perhaps a different idea. It takes away from the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a ghost. He's not an ap apparition or something or a feeling or anything. He's a person. Uh, be that as it, as it is, uh, I'll move on from there. Um, but the hearing Jesus say here, wait in Jerusalem because you're going to be uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. So we're now in that 10-day ten, ten period and I'm suggesting that they're asking one of the questions, what's going to happen? And someone says, well, whatever it is, it's going to happen soon. Of course, the, uh, they knew that the Feast of Pentecost was coming up, but nothing had been suggested about what might happen that would be unusual on this day of Pentecost. I mean, after all, it was the uh, 15 centuries there have been having days of Pentecost um, why would this one be any different little did they know uh, but the fact is here they are with these questions what was Jesus talking about what will it look like how can it be who is this other person this comforter this spirit of truth um, 
it's going to happen soon and so <clears throat> I suggest to you that they were reflecting on these very things I know that at, at least two of the disciples I only know the name of one and his name was Andrew uh, but at least two of the disciples had actually formerly been disciples of John the Baptist and <clears throat> My, my opinion, for what it's worth, I think, I think, I think I'm right, mind you, uh, is that the other disciple was John. Because as I read the Gospel of John, one of the features of John's Gospel is that he never names himself at any point. Uh, he refers to himself, we believe, when he says things like, the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, for example. Uh, <clears throat> So it's no surprise that he doesn't use his name in this context where uh, he is recording the fact that there were these two men who had been disciples of John the Baptist who heard of Jesus and so on. But for those two men in particular, there may have been others, but for those two that are mentioned particularly, um, in the context of these baffling questions, and they're trying to recap what they know and bring together what they know. For those two, their minds would go right back to that vivid, never to be forgotten occasion three and a half years ago when they were actually with John the Baptist in the wilderness uh, when he was speaking. And uh, uh, it was there that they, they, they heard this, this, this phrase, uh, he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Um, and, and Jesus actually endorses that in this first chapter of Acts. He said, John truly said that. So it wasn't just that John thought up some phrase and sort of added it in. Uh, he was speaking uh, that which was the word of God. Jesus confirms that in, in this uh, chapter 1 and verse 5 here. <clears throat> The, the, the impressive thing that is on my mind is that they would have heard John the Baptist saying uh, concerning he who was coming after him. Uh, he, he makes it plain. He says, for this reason he's coming in order to baptize men and women in the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm, once again, I'm thinking of these men thinking and pondering on these things. Was this that we're now anticipating, this promise of the Father, actually the reason for God becoming incarnate? Is that what John was saying there? In order to baptize men and women in the Holy Spirit? And they would have concluded as I do, if that were true, this that's about to happen is an incredibly significant event. <coughs> In fact, it's such a big event that It, it impacts itself on the whole plan of salvation. It, what, what am I looking at here? If this is why he came, and I can find some other scriptures which speak about why he came to destroy the works of the devil and so forth uh, and so on, then, then I can only conclude this, that whatever John was talking about and whatever Jesus has been alluding to, that's been mysterious to us, that's going to happen shortly, is so significant that it is indispensable to redemption. Think of that. In fact, if I believe that, and as a matter of fact I do, then that would mean that without it, a person is not yet a Christian. If this is why he came, to do this, and I, know, and I know from a plenitude of other scriptures that when he came, he was coming to bring salvation for men and women. 
And, and this is now being in, it's sort of interfacing with it. It's being brought together with this that John was saying back in that early stage, that Jesus is now authenticated as being truly the word of God. This, this, is, this is really big. You know, I think there's a, there's a common error, <clears throat> all too common, I think it's a fatal error, uh, and that is to undervalue the things of God. <clears throat> Uh, you know, the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And f for many of us, I being one of such, we've been raised in a Christian home. We've been hearing these things, you know, as far back as our memory goes. Uh, and we become familiar with phrases and statements. Some of them have become cliches. Uh, um, not deliberately, but just because of repetition and familiarity and so on. And I even the things of God. This is why I was trying to, talking about the disciples and two of them coming to Liverpool or somewhere, to, to sort of shake us into thinking, this is big. This is really big. And then we've been thinking about this statement that's now on, on the table for us, uh, about the significance of this baptism in the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and I'm suggesting to you that in so many ways we diminish these things and we lose the impact and we miss what God has done and what God is saying and what God is wanting to do in your life and in my life in these days. I think, for example, it's all too common to diminish this very phrase that we're looking at at the moment to baptize in the Holy Spirit. And so it's made, here's a cliche, uh, it's made, well, it's the second blessing in the minds of, of, of many, certainly. Um, and there are those who say, well, the evidence that this has been experienced in a person's life is they speak in tongues. And I'm saying, that doesn't, that doesn't gel with what we've just been seeing here. Huh? I'm, I'm, I'm not diminishing the gifts of the Spirit at the moment. I'm wanting to elevate what this is that we are being exposed to here in the Scriptures. Uh, I, I, I think, I think if, if we say, well, this is... this Because uh, frankly, I think that in many churches, it depends on which sort of brand we're looking at out there, uh, there's, there's a dismissing of this phrase. They're dismissive about this phrase, so we don't really hear much about it. It's what John the Baptist said, and, and that's it. Uh, on the other hand, we've got you know, bodies of people who make much of it, and, and they say this is the second blessing, and you need this. You know, This is the much more that God wants to do in your life, and then the proof of it will be, as I've mentioned already, you may speak in tongues, or you will speak in tongues, and so on. And I'm saying... in, in in, in underestimating or undervaluing uh, the, the true baptism in the Holy Spirit, we end up undervaluing the new birth. What then is the new birth? And of course, we've got, we've got whether we agree entirely on this together or not, it remains to be seen, I'm sure, but uh, there's, a, there's a tendency in our modern evangelicalism to so um, undervalue the Christian gospel that becoming a Christian is simply the matter of making a decision in one setting or another. Uh, uh, deciding for Christ is a cliche phrase. Uh, and we pray what has been called the sinner's prayer. And when you've prayed it, now you're in, now you've got the Holy Spirit, off you go. Uh, that's a bit callous, or it can sound a bit callous, but that's about the way it is, uh, and so on. And we, 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 we've, we've undervalued. What is the new birth? There's such a need for a redefinition to, to, to intelligent, hungry, spiritually hungry men and women say, no, this is what it means. And we're doing that, we're saying this is what... We want to know about this baptism in the Holy Spirit. What is this? If we underestimate that, that seems to have such a 
prominent place in the way this is all unfolding, we, we end up saying, well, well, the new birth wasn't sufficient to do it, so we got this sort of booster shot further down the road here. Is that right? Is that, is that what is being taught in Scripture? And of course, another conclusion that misleads us, I think it's a fatal error, again, is that we've been told and led to believe that the disciples prior to the day of Pentecost were born again. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. Uh, the new covenant, uh, the, the, the price on the cross was paid to inaugurate the new covenant, uh, certainly. But be before that, th these, were, these were religious, devoutly religious Jewish people uh, who were privileged to be in the company of Jesus, to listen to his teaching and to embrace it and so on. But, but Jesus says, don't go anywhere. Go back to Jerusalem. Stay there until this that I've been talking about happens to you. They needed it. This big thing that Jesus came to make a possible uh, for men and women. And if we believe, well, the disciples, well, they were Christians. And, well, so what happened then after that? Uh, and what does that mean for ourselves? We've, we've undervalued the gospel. We've undervalued the work of Christ, we've undervalued uh, the, the redemption, we've undervalued this that we're talking about here uh, this morning. I think, I think people, see, they're seeking this more because the, they haven't really experienced the true new birth. The, the, mind you if, you, if you go down that road too far, and I've been down this road, you run into trouble and people fall out with you. You say, oh no, this doesn't fit in with the way we've always thought about it and so on. But I'm, I believe that this is the truth. And we can sort of be in this sort of crazy world where we just sort of accept it. Well, yeah, well, he, he's a good guy or, you know, he's prayed the sinner's prayer and so on. Nice personality, got a lovely ability to even teach the Bible. It's more than that. It's a dynamic work of God that we're faced with. And we need, and, and it's, when I, when I remind myself that this that John the Baptist termed the baptism in the Holy Spirit was the reason that Jesus came to do this. That's, he didn't say he's, he's coming so that he can, and I can think of a list of things I could suggest, but it's foolish. But this is what he said it was for. That tells me this is important it's more than a second blessing it's more than an anointing for a more fruitful ministry it's more than an ability to speak in tongues and it's certainly not in order to experience these sort of hysterical things that some people uh, get involved in and say that this is uh, the evidence of the holy spirit i believe that what john referred to there and jesus authenticated is uh, a prophetic pointer to the action of regeneration or to the new birth. It's a, it's a prophetic, prophetic pointer toward it. Uh, in other words, and I wrote this down because I want to say it exactly as I believe it to be, that all the vital elements of what John called the baptism in the Holy Spirit are included in and fulfilled in and expanded in the new birth. As we look more closely into this, I'm hearing what Jesus is saying. Do you remember these? You, you, you do, I'm sure. Jesus talking to his disciples, we're back in John 14, and, and just, just cutting out this one short statement, he said, I am with you. I shall be in you. In a sense, that says everything. This is, this is the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. God with, God in. Right there. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, and John was alluding to it, he said, he'll baptize you, and I'll talk a little more about this in just a minute, in the Holy Spirit. In is the word 
in this context. Not with. Mind you, if he's in you, he's with you. But if all we know is with, then we're missing the real reason that Jesus came into the world and gave his life on the cross. Uh, the, the first principle of the, 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 the message that John the Baptist was preaching at that time was tied up in this one little word, in. And sadly, most of your translations don't use that word um, in, in the reference to, of John. It says, he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. But the, the, the Greek word, it's a preposition, a Greek preposition is E-N-N. -N. It can be translated different ways, but uh, it's, it, it, this, this is what it means, and I, perhaps I can illustrate this by just telling you my father had a, a Newbury Bible, which is Thomas Newbury was a man who lived a long time ago, and he, without computers in those days, he did an incredible work, obviously incredibly knowledgeable in Hebrew and Greek, and he devised a, a whole s system of symbols which he incorporates into the text. Uh, to show us moods and to show us uh, all kinds of features of the, these two languages, which are both very full languages concern, con com compared or contrasted to our language. Um, we have three tenses in the Greek, they've got five tenses and so forth. And I, I'm remembering just now one page which in the Bible, right in between the Testaments, I believe it was, uh, there was a, a diagram that, that um, Thomas Newbery had come up with and so it was a diagram, a very simple box. And then he had lines coming to and from this box. And this was to illustrate, uh, help people to understand the various um, prepositions in the Greek language. And one, one, one of these uh, words, it, it didn't, have a, didn't, even, didn't even have a line it's, it's, the, it's the Greek word which we translate in. It's just right in the box. In. Um, we may, if I allow myself a little time, we may be able to think of another word which, which is the preposition eis, E-I-S in our language. Uh, that, it's a relevant word here for what we're looking at, but that word means, and it's most probably, I think, translated into. So th here's a line. This, I thought I'd have to say this at this point because I've talked about lines. Here's a line that's coming from who knows where and it comes into the box. So it comes in, but it, 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 it suggests this, this, is, this is the way it's moving. Someone's coming into something, into the box, which is where we're all to be. But with the preposition in, it, it carries through the idea of to be in and at total rest. It's fixed, it's there, it's solid, it's secure, it's immovable. And this can be illustrated with other verses that we can't try and find right now, and so on. But this, uh, let us not forget, is, is the crux of the difference and contrast between the old covenant and the new. Take that one home with you. Uh, I am with you, says Jesus. I shall be, future. I shall be in you, not many days hence. And it fulfills also the, the mystery uh, which is revealed at the end of the ages. We could read about that in Colossians chapter 1. We're not going there this morning, and so on. <clears throat> Since I've mentioned the, the word into, ice, um, um, this is a great statement where Paul says that you, in chapter 3 of Ephesians, that you may be filled into all of the fullness of God. All this makes so much sense of what John was talking about. I baptize you with water, but the one who comes after me who is greater than I am. I'm not worthy to even unloose his shoelaces. He, by way of total and absolute contrast, will baptize you, not in water, 
in, in the Holy Spirit of God. As we, we remember just a number of things coming to my mind here. Uh, Paul talks about being in Christ, doesn't he? And if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation and so on. These abs- th- th- once you see this, it's written all over the, all over the New Testament, everywhere. John's message, John's baptism was allegorical. Jesus' baptism is going to be dynamic. It's going to accomplish something very real and wonderful. Um, if we just look at one more thing that uh, I'm digging things up from a long way in my past here. Um, but um, when, when we read the words in the scripture, uh, uh, John's, John's words, he shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And so, so many times we hear people talk about baptism in the Spirit. Well, that phrase never, expe- never appears in the Bible. It's not baptism in the Spirit. And as a matter of fact, in the, in the, te- in the text that I'm quoting, the words of John, it, it has no definite article. This is all foreign to our language, isn't it? But that, the definite article is, is expressed in a number of ways, but very frequently by the word the. He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit. But that's not there in the original Greek. That phrase, if, it, if we read it literally, would be, um, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you in spirit holy. In spirit holy. And the, right now, and I'm trying to hurry along, believe me, uh, that the dominant feature uh, of this statement is holiness. He's referring to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But the way, the way it comes here, he shall baptize you in spirit, holy. The, and the essence of the spirit is holy. He's holy God. The wonderful thing about what we're looking at here is that uh, and uh, and we, we know that uh, in the whole teaching of justification, that in that process, Paul explains this, of course, later. He, he says that, um, that God, because of what Christ has accomplished at the cross, he has imputed to us his holiness. And that word imputed is, as we've learned, I'm sure, it's an accounting word. It means it's calculated. Um, his holiness is credited to my account. And on that basis, I am accepted by God. Not by works of righteousness, which I have done. But it's by his mercy that he saved us. He, he through the redemptive work of Christ, has credited his righteousness, his holiness to me. And on that basis, I am acceptable to God. Uh, now, experiencing what John is talking about and what we're looking at this morning, the Holy Spirit of God, um, his, his intent is to produce holiness within our lives. Imputed to me, produced in me. Two different things. I'm not saved by what he produces in me. I'm saved by what he's imputed to me. But rest assured, this Holy Spirit who is to be in us, this Holy Spirit who is to be in me, will be intent upon producing that holiness of Christ's life in each and every one of us. And in John's passage again, just one last look back here, he he, he incorporates ideas of um, two, 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 two or three words stick in my mind. Do you remember John said, when he comes, he will lay the axe to the root of the tree. And then again, he says, he will thoroughly purge his floor. And without going into a lot of detail here, do you see, this is being said in the context of this 
which is the promise of the Father, which was going to happen shortly to these disciples. It was going to be a work of God the Holy Spirit. It would be that this spirit fire baptism, he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire is the full expression. This, this fiery spirit baptism will have a destructive element to it. He must destroy the power of slavery to sin, for example, in our lives. He must terminate that which has been functioning and working in us. And, and then he works by his spirit with our responses to him now to refine that which is the person that I am or that you are and so on. This is that fundamental unmovable purpose for which Jesus came. What we're looking at clearly is the work of redemption. After Pentecost, these men have got a new story. I'm almost finished. They've been in the upper room on that never to be forgotten morning. They heard the sound of the rushing mighty wind. The fire from heaven had fallen. Suddenly, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were utterly and completely transformed. We can find some scriptural evidence to support the contrast between these frightened men immediately prior to this in the upper room with the door locked and now they go out with such confidence and boldness proclaiming uh, the message of the gospel. This that took place in the upper room that morning was what John the Baptist called the baptism in the spirit holy. This that happened in the upper room was what Jesus called the promise of the Father. Uh, it's what Peter the Apostle described as on the day of Pentecost in this way he said this this that happened this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and then he goes on to quote from Joel's prophecy another five verses on this uh, follow that this is what Paul referred to as the one baptism do you remember in Ephesians 4 and verse 5 uh, this is what he calls, Paul the Apostle again, what he calls in Romans chapter 6, the baptism into Christ's death. This baptism with spirit holy is clearly the one baptism, which is a baptism into the death of Christ. We're looking at redemption here without any question. Uh, Paul goes on to say it's by the Lord's mercy they have been saved through or by the washing of regeneration, that's new birth, that means, uh, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's Titus 3 and verse 5. Um, this is what Paul again refers to as being filled into all the fullness of God. Uh, this is what Paul meant when he speaks about being strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man, so that, or in order that, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Ephesians 3, 16, 17. It's that that's at the back of Paul's words when he says, Christ liveth in me. It's by the Holy Spirit of God and this mighty work Amen. This is, not, this is not the gospel light. This is the, the true baptism in, in the Holy Spirit of God. Peter also declared on the day of Pentecost, this promise is for you and it's for your children and for them that are afar off. For as many as the Lord our God shall call. This very briefly and perhaps somewhat awkwardly was those early disciples story. It was developing, it was increasing. It reached this great crescendo on the day of Pentecost. My question this morning is, is it your story? 
Charles Wesley responded this way. Oh, that in me the sacred fire might now begin to glow. Burn up the dross of base desire and make the mountains flow. Oh, that it now from heaven might fall and all my sins consume. Come, Holy Ghost, for thee I call. Spirit of burning, come. Refining fire, go through my heart. Illuminate my soul. Scatter thy life through every part and sanctify the whole. Amen. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, we thank you this morning that we have right here before us the Holy Scriptures. We thank you that they contain the word that God, our God, has breathed. Our prayer continually, Lord, is that you will breathe again across the sacred page and illuminate and make real to us your word of truth. We pray, Father, that even with these fumbling words this morning, you, Lord, will succeed in reaching the deep parts of our inner man and remind us and refresh us in the truth, Lord, in the truth of God, in the truth of the gospel. Lord, we pray that you will give to each and every one of us hungering and thirsting hearts, Lord, that are not satisfied, that refuse to be satisfied with, with some light, superficial message. But Lord, we come hungering to truly know you and to truly know your word and to truly and f more fully experience that which you have made so possible for us. Will you do that in each one of us hearing this message this morning? In Jesus' name, amen.